It is advisable to study the appropriate essential anatomy as outlined in the primer of regional anesthesia anatomy before studying the continuous interscalene block. The continuous interscalene block is indicated for intra and postoperative pain management following major shoulder surgery. Examples of such surgery include shoulder arthroplasty, rotator cuff repair, and other major shoulder surgery. This block is probably not indicated for frozen shoulder. Most authors use 20 to 40 milliliters ropivacaine, 0.5 to 0.75 percent for intraoperative analgesia, and an infusion of 0.2 percent is usually used for the management of postoperative pain. There are various infusion strategies, but it should be successful to start off with 0.2% ropivacaine or 0.25% bupivacaine at 5 milliliters per hour. Additional patient-controlled regional anesthesia of 2 to 10 milliliters bolusis at a lockout time of 30 to 60 minutes can be used. There is a whole spectrum of infusion strategies, and these depend on the desired effect. For example, the infusion strategy for a rotator cuff repair, where motor function is initially undesirable, would use a high volume and high concentration of local anesthetic drug initially, followed by a high infusion rate of a relatively high concentration drug and zero, or a small volume, of patient-controlled bolusis initially. Adhesive capsulitis, or frozen shoulder, on the other hand, would require a small volume and low concentration of initial bolus drug since motor function and patient participation in physical therapy is desirable, followed by a low infusion volume of a low concentration drug but higher volume and concentration patient-controlled bolusis for physical therapy sessions. It is also desirable to have a higher infusion volume at nighttime without the necessity of patient-controlled bolusis to ensure that the patient has a good night's rest with a lower infusion rate and higher patient-controlled bolusis at daytime. The osteotomes, dermatomes, and neurotomes shown for the single injection interscalene block are similar for the continuous interscalene block. It should, however, be clear that although a wider spread of local anesthetic will be present during the high-volume initial bolus injections, this area of block coverage will be smaller and more nerve-specific during the infusion of a smaller volume of a more dilute regional anesthetic agent. The osteotomes that are included in this block are illustrated in this diagram. When studying this illustration, it should be clear that the inferior part of the glenoid, as well as the distal part of the ulna and bones of the fourth and fifth finger, is usually not covered by interscalene block unless very large volumes of local anesthetic agent are used. The C5, C6, and C7 dermatomes are usually included in interscalene block, but not the C8 and T1 dermatomes. The neurotomes involved in the interscalene block include the neurotomes of the axillary nerve, the radial nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, and the median nerve. The ulnar nerve and brachio and antibrachiocutaneous nerves are usually not covered. Similarly, the intercostal brachial nerves are excluded. The landmarks are similar to those for a single injection interscalene nerve block. Cover the area with a fenestrated clear sterile plastic drape after skin preparation. As for the single injection interscalene nerve block, perform a superficial cervical plexus block and also anesthetize the path intended for subcutaneous tunneling. In this case, this is towards the suprasternal notch. Make sure that the external jugular vein is not injured by going deep to it with the needle. The nerve stimulator set to a current output of 1 to 2 milliamps, a frequency of 2 hertz, and a pulse width of 200 to 300 microseconds is clipped to the proximal end of an insulated 17 or 18 gauge TUI needle. The interscalene groove is palpated with the middle and index finger, and the fingers are split to put traction on the skin while leaving the middle finger in the interscalene groove. Needle entry is from behind the sternocleidomastoid muscle halfway from the clavicle to the mastoid. The needle's entry is longitudinal 
aiming towards the brachial plexus just deep to where the left hand middle finger is placed. This is generally in the direction of the ipsilateral nipple. The phrenic nerve can be encountered as is demonstrated in this recording. The needle is then withdrawn slightly and moved approximately one centimeter posterior until the biceps or triceps muscle is twitching, which indicates stimulation of the superior or middle trunk of the brachial plexus. The nerve stimulator can then be turned down and a clear brisk motor response should still be present at 0.3 to 0.5 milliamps. This indicates correct needle placement. It is essential that no saline or local anesthetic agent is injected through the needle at this stage since this will make nerve stimulation via the catheter later impossible or very difficult. If the needle is too posterior, the dorsal scapula nerve will be encountered. This is indicated by contractions of the rhomboid muscles, which can easily be mistaken for deltoid muscle contractions. The stylet of the needle is removed, the nerve stimulator is attached to the proximal end of the stimulating catheter, and the distal end of the catheter is placed inside the needle shaft. The broad black mark on the catheter indicates that the catheter's tip is now situated at the tip of the needle. The catheter is advanced beyond the needle tip. If the motor response stops, carefully withdraw the catheter to inside the needle shaft again. Rotate the needle a quarter of a turn clockwise or counterclockwise and advance the catheter again. If the motor response again disappears, withdraw the catheter again, turn the needle in the opposite direction, and try again. Repeat this maneuver by rotating the needle withdrawing the needle slightly or advancing the needle slightly until the motor response remains constant and brisk during advancement of the catheter. Make sure that the catheter is always withdrawn to inside the needle shaft before the needle is manipulated. The needle is now removed without disturbing the catheter, similar to epidural catheterization. The catheter can now be tested again by attaching the nerve stimulator to its proximal end, it should then be tumbled subcutaneously to prevent catheter dislodgement. The inner stylet of the needle is placed subcutaneously from a point approximately 1 to 2 millimeters from the catheter exit site towards the suprasternal notch, taking care not to puncture the external jugular vein by going deep to it. If a skin bridge is not required, the stylet of the needle enters through the same catheter exit site, taking care not to damage the catheter. The needle is then railroaded back over the stylet while still taking special care not to disturb or damage the catheter. The catheter is advanced retrogradely through the needle and the needle is removed, leaving a loop of catheter at the original catheter exit site. The catheter is situated deep to the external jugular vein and exits in the area of the suprasternal notch. Place the piece of silicone tubing that protected the catheter tip while it was packaged in the loop to protect the skin bridge. The skin bridge makes removal of the catheter easier but may be more prone to leaking of local anesthetic agent. Place the snap lock on the proximal end of the catheter and attach the nerve stimulator and the syringe with the local anesthetic agent to the snap lock. The nerve stimulator is set to an output of zero and then slowly turned up until a motor response can just be seen. The motor response ceases immediately after the injection is started. This constitutes a positive Raj test, which further assures that the secondary block, via the catheter as well as the primary block, will be successful. Place the snap lock and catheter in the stat lock and place this on the other shoulder of the patient. Cover the catheter with a transparent adhesive dressing to enable daily inspection of the exit site of the catheter. Removal of the catheter is a sterile procedure. Clean the skin bridge area with betadine or another suitable disinfectant. Hold the proximal part of the catheter with the left hand, fold the silicone tubing skin bridge around the catheter with the right hand, and remove the distal end of the catheter. Inspect the tip of the catheter for completeness, keep this part sterile, and with the left hand remove the entire catheter.